Um, I'm going to start with uh, showing this table of specs of CETA and GRAM. Uh, so the two clusters are very similar by design to each other, and a lot of things I'm going to show today on CETA, they also apply to GRAM. And I want to say that um, CETA and GRAM, so it, independently of your geographical location, you can log into CETA and GRAM, and you can use either cluster unless you have a rack allocation on a specific system. Uh, so uh, CETA and GRAM have uh, both close to 30,000 processes, and most of these processes are sitting on 120 gigabyte um, base nodes, 120 gigabyte uh, shared memory base nodes. And uh, we also have a, a fair number of uh, fat or large memory nodes for uh, running codes that require a lot of memory. So one example is uh, bioinformatics. I know in, uh, there are quite a few bioinformatics codes that require access to large shared memory uh, space. And so these are the nodes where you would uh, want to run uh, these codes. So uh, when you submit a job, you don't have to specify explicitly which type of node uh, you want this job to run on. Depending on, uh, on how much memory, primarily on how much memory uh, you're asking for, the job will go to the right allocation, to the right type of node. Uh, so in addition to uh, regular uh, CPU nodes, we also have uh, GPU nodes, two types with 128 gigabytes and 256 gigabytes of memory. And these uh, come with uh, latest NVIDIA P100 uh, Pascal GPUs. So these are meant for running pretty much any type of job that requires GPUs for, uh, for uh, general purpose uh, computing. So whether it's molecular dynamics code or something else. And these nodes can also be used for uh, visualization. Uh, so when you log in uh, to a cluster, to CETA for example, by default, you will find yourself in your home directory uh, that has a 50 gigabyte quota for each user. And all files are back in your home are backed up uh, daily, or I should say on a nightly basis. Uh, so home is meant primarily for storing, storing your important files, your codes, your setup scripts, and, and, and so on. But it's not, as Patrick mentioned, it's not a high performance uh, system, uh, file system, in the sense that if your code outputs a lot of data then you probably want to send this data, save this data to the Scratch file system, which is simply designed for tuned for uh, for high I/O, uh, well, for high I/O rates and for storing uh, large files with much better performance. So the problem, well, the, the caveat with Scratch that you should be aware of is that uh, while it does not have a quota, it has a purge policy. So we know that people will be writing a lot of files to, to Scratch, and it will uh, be getting full quite uh, quite quickly. So depending on when that happens, uh, we'll be deleting all the files. And of course, we will not be deleting any files without letting you know first in advance, few days in advance. But in, in, in general, all files over than say uh, a month or two months will be uh, deleted with an advance warning. And so the idea of Scratch is that it's uh, a very high performance, fast file system for short term uh, Scratch storage. So if you wanna uh, save files that, uh, well, for longer than, than a few months, then you can copy them either to home or to one of the archival uh, storage systems that a project already mentioned. So project and Neoline project is disk storage, Neoline is tape storage. So project is available to every user, uh, there's a quota, whereas Neoline tape storage is uh, available uh, by request. So uh, if you're submitting a rack request for rack allocation, uh, then please let us know that you need tape storage and we'll be happy to provide it to you. And so finally in this table, we'll have the uh, local storage TMP uh, on each node. So this is a uh, NSSD, very fast SSD, a local to each node. Uh, that means that when your job is running and you're writing something to a node, uh, then when your job stops, you have to, before it stops, you have to make sure that if these files are important, you actually copy them out to, to your home directory, your scratch directory, because they will not appear on the uh, login node as usual. Uh, so we have a lot of information on uh, these file systems in our wiki, how to check for usage, how to request more usage in our wiki. So please check the wiki pages and, and there's a link at the top of this slide. Uh, so logging into, uh, into uh, seed and gram, uh, please you use your uh, Compute Canada account, not your Westgrid account. Uh, to log in, you will simply use SSH and SSH command or SSH client. So if you're uh, sitting in front of a Unix uh, laptop, either Mac or Linux, machine, then SSH is already a command that is available via terminal. You simply say SSH, your username at cedar.computecanon.ca. If you're on Windows, there are quite a few options. We generally recommend Mobile Xterm because it uh, not only gives you the command line, but also the X11 server on your laptop. But there are quite a few other options, things like uh, PuTTY or SIGWIN, or even the Bash uh, Windows subsystem for, uh, for Linux. So quite a few options on, on Windows, it's just you have to install these clients by hand, so they're not available by default. 
And as I mentioned, uh, on compute on C and Gram, you have to use your Compute Canada accounts, which uh, which is a separate set of accounts, different from from Westgrid, uh, regular legacy Westgrid accounts. Uh, so I highly recommend to set up SSH key pairs uh, for uh, passwordless login to C and Gram, simply because you don't have to type the password every time. And this is especially useful if you're editing remote files, because, for example, in Emacs or there are quite a few uh, editors for, well, for, for Mac and, and Linux and Windows that allow you to edit remote files. And if you have a, a password, uh, uh, sorry, passwordless uh, key, uh, SSH key uh, setup, then you don't have to type uh, your password every time you save or, or load a remote file. Uh, so GUI connections, X11 forwarding works. Uh, we don't recommend to use X11 forwarding because it's, it's slower than uh, VNC clients, remote desktop clients, things like VNC and x 2 uh, But we don't have uh, VNC and x 2 fully set up yet. We're still uh, playing with the uh, setup. So right now, you can actually start VNC uh, remote desktop client as part of your compute job on uh, C and Gram. Uh, but uh, it's not yet fully set up and it's not documented because we're still playing with, uh, with the environment. And perhaps it's highly likely that we'll provide x to go on, on, on the login node as well. Right now, we don't. Uh, cluster software environment at a glance. Uh, so all systems run Linux, CentOS 7. That means if uh, you're not familiar with Linux, I highly recommend that you follow some tutorial on, on basic commands in Linux. And we do teach uh, Linux basics in various webinars and also in software carpentry uh, throughout the year at various institutions. So for example, in September, early September, I'll be teaching uh, software carpentry uh, with half a day introduction to Linux uh, at UBC. And uh, just take a look at the events uh, section uh, in our webpage, westgrid.ca, and you'll find these sessions. Uh, so programming languages will provide pretty much everything that is standard for uh, HPC environment. So the, the uh, traditional uh, HPC uh, languages, compiled languages, C, C++, Fortran. We provide all of these in multiple uh, configurations. So I'm going to talk about these in more detail uh, in a few minutes. We also provide uh, non, well, non, I should say, non-HPC programming languages, things like Python, R, and Java. So these don't perform as well as compiled languages, and you probably know, uh, are aware of this, so I'm not going to spend any time on this. We're also uh, are now trying to configure Chapel, uh, that is a new programming language, open source programming language from uh, Cray, and it will be installed on both CD and Gram. Right now, it's not yet available, but, but it's probably going to be available in a few days. So for uh, CPU parallel development, we provide all the industry standard libraries and compilers, things like MPI, message passing interface, for programming uh, distributed memory uh, parallel codes and open MPN threads for programming shared memory codes. Uh, GPU parallel development support, we provide uh, CUDA and OpenCL. As I mentioned, uh, CUDA and Gram have uh, new uh, GPUs that fully support the latest CUDA and OpenCL is, well, is available as well. So for simpler GPU programming, we also have OpenACC that is provided by uh, the PGI compiler, commercial compiler that we have on the systems. So for job schedule, as Patrick already mentioned, we're using Sloom, open source uh, scheduler and resource manager. And I'm going to show you many examples of how to submit jobs uh, via Sloom. So for software installations, we have this morning, I counted, we have around close to 200 packages installed already uh, centrally on the systems. And these are available via software modules. I'm going to show you in the next slide how to load these. So they're generally installed uh, under CVMFS uh, directory tree. and uh, you have to use the right, well, the, to load the module before you can actually uh, use these packages. If you find that something is not available uh, or, and you want to use it on the cluster, please let us know. Uh, you have, there are two options. Either you can install this yourself in your home direct, well, in, in one of your directories, and we'll be happy to compile it for you. Or uh, you can simply ask us to install it, and if it's a, a package that runs in Linux, that can be compiled in Linux, and that is compatible with um, the HPC environment, on our clusters, uh, let us know, and we'll be happy to install it for you. Um, so software modules, as already mentioned, we have close to 200 packages. And to uh, make these packages available, uh, you have to load the appropriate module. So the command for that is module load followed by the package name. And to list all uh, packages that are available, you can simply say module avail, optionally followed by a pattern or package name. Module spider will give you a little bit more information. Module unload, module show to show more detailed information on what the module does exactly. Uh, so uh, all uh, prerequisites and all module dependencies are loaded automatically. I'm going to show you in a second how, uh, what well, few examples. Uh, so, and finally, what I want to say here is that uh, modules, uh, so if, if your job uses a specific uh, package, a specific software, the correct module, the right model has to be loaded 
before uh, you submit your job. So let me now switch to the terminal. Uh, this is the terminal on my laptop, and I'm going to log into CETA. So I simply run the command SSH, my username at cita.computecanada.ca, and hopefully the fonts are big enough so you can actually see them. If not, then you can double click on the, uh, on the shared window and it'll expand into a larger window with, uh, that you can resize to make the fonts bigger. Uh, so right now I'm on CETA in my home directory on CETA. And um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna simply type module avail, oops, sorry, module avail to show all the available available modules, and you see there are quite a few of these. So you can actually specify things you're looking for. For example, if you're interested in, let's say, visualization, you can check for the Paraview module, module available Paraview, and we'll show that there are two versions of Paraview available. One is a GUI version, a QT version. The other one is the off-screen module, uh, sorry, off-screen version for CPU-based rendering without opening any windows. If you want to check for, let's say, all versions of the Intel compiler we have, well, you can simply see module avail Intel, and it will tell you that there are two versions of the Intel compiler. Let's say you're interested in all versions of the GNU compiler, module avail GCC will tell you also that we have uh, two versions of the GNU compiler and so on. So the spider command will give you a little bit more information, but uh, the idea is the same, that it will simply list all the all the modules that are available. So by default, when you log in into uh, CEDA, uh, some modules will be loaded. Uh, and to check the list of loaded modules, you can simply type module list, and uh, this will show the default modules. So notice that the Intel uh, compiler module, this one is loaded by default. So if you compile codes, the default compiler is the commercial Intel compiler. If you want to switch to GNU compiler, that is very easy to do. You simply say module load GCC and hit enter, and what happened uh, was that the Intel compiler module was unloaded automatically, and then the system loaded the uh, GNU compiler module. And it also unloaded the uh, previously loaded OpenMPI, so MPI parallel, uh, uh, parallel programming library uh, module for Intel, and loaded the right OpenMPI module for, uh, for, for uh, the GNU compiler. So now if I do module list, again, it will tell me that the GNU compiler GCC 5.4.0 module is loaded now, and we also have the right OpenMPI module for the GNU library. And then uh, to unload a module, I can simply type unload, and then followed by the module name. For example, I can unload the OpenMPI module, and, and here we go. And then check the loaded modules again. Now I have five modules instead of the six loaded. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. A file transfer, just want to mention these very briefly. Uh, there are several options you have to transfer files between different uh, file systems, well, between different file systems, between different clusters in uh, Compute Canada and Westgrid and, and your local laptop or desktop. You can use command line tools, things like CQ Copy or Async that are available on Mac Linux and also there are, there are clients for, uh, for Windows. And so for these, you can simply say CQ copy uh, source, uh, the location of the source file, the location of the target directory where you're putting this file, and uh, CQ copy will simply uh, copy securely with SSH encryption the file from one location to another. But in this case, the first example from a laptop to the CEDA uh, cluster, and uh, in the second example from CEDA uh, to your local uh, machine. Uh, and also you can use uh, async command that will, uh, so the idea of async is that instead of uh, supplying the exact file name that you want to copy, it will simply sync the, uh, the uh, two directories, so for example, a local directory and a remote directory. So the problem with async, it, uh, its performance is not particularly great, especially when you have a lot of files in a directory. And especially if you're uh, trying to transfer very large files, we highly recommend to use the Globus file transfer tool. So there's a web portal at globus.computecanada.ca. And if you go there, you can log in with your Compute Canada credentials. And then you'll need to add, open uh, two endpoints. So basically, there'll be a panel with a file system on the left and a panel on the right. And you can simply click on the file or files that you want to copy from one location to another and you, you click on uh, the copy or move buttons, or button or something like that, and it will start transfer, and then you can even log out, you can uh, close your browser, and it will all happen in the background, and then once the transfer is, is finished, it will, uh, by default, it will send you an email that a transfer is done. And it's actually, it's very, very reliable, uh, very safe, and it's very convenient because you don't have to stay uh, logged into the system to actually, uh, to actually transfer files. And performance-wise, it's also really great. So it's much faster than regular secure copy or async, but there are a few caveats. So sometimes uh, you will get into problems with Eduroam or your ISP, but that's, that's a, a standalone issue. 
Uh, so install compilers, we have three families of compilers, the Intel commercial compiler, the GNU compiler, and the PGI compiler installed on the systems. So this can be used for compiling uh, serial codes, MPI, MPI codes, and OpenMP codes. So uh, to compile, let's say, the, uh, a regular serial code, C code, uh, with the Intel compiler, all you have to do is simply say ICC, followed by uh, the file name of your source code, and it will create an executable that you can run or submit to uh, the job scheduler. If you want to compile an MPI code, uh, whether it's a C, C++, or a Fortran code, then you'll need to use one of the MPI, MPI wrappers, MPI scripts, uh, according to the options in this table. And then if you want to compile an OpenMP code, you will need to pass the right flag, whether it's the minus Q OpenMP for the Intel compiler, minus F OpenMP for the GNU compiler, or minus MP for the PGI compiler. Uh, to, the, uh, to the corresponding um, uh, 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 command line. So uh, if you want to see what the MPI, uh, MPI scripts do exactly underline, you can simply type MPI, let's say MPI CC, there's the show, and it will tell you exactly which command uh, it uses and which flags it uses to link to the uh, right libraries on the system. Uh, so uh, here's the slide on the scheduler. Let me actually go back to the shell, I will log out and then I will log in again to CETA. And here are my uh, default modules. So the Intel module is again loaded by default. I will go into the directory that has some uh, sample files. Uh, so I will, here, here's a bunch of uh, C files that I have. I'm going to compile a, uh, a uh, serial C code and I'm going to submit it to the, uh, to the scheduler. So to compile the C code, right now I have the Intel compiler loaded. I simply say ICC followed by the name of the uh, source code. So in, in this case, it's a simple uh, serial C code to compile Pi via, uh, by a large series, and then I'll say that. And actually, it's a very good idea to supply the name of the executable. So I'm going to call it serial. The executable is called serial, and then serial was just created right now. I can check for it. It's sitting right here. And then I'm going to use the following uh, job script to submit the job. So this is also mirrored in the slide. If I look in the slide, um, what I'm doing here, I'm uh, basically saying that here's the job script called job uh, underscore serial.sh. And it's basically a bash script that contains the following flags uh, to the Slurm scheduler. So everything that starts with the uh, number sign as batch uh, followed by a specific flag is an option to the, uh, to the, um, to the scheduler. And you can pass the, these options either by the job uh, submission script, like in this case, or you can also uh, supply them in the, uh, in the command line. We prefer that you do that inside the, uh, the uh, script simply because if you submit a lot of jobs, then you will have a track record of which options you used exactly. Whereas if you uh, supply these in the, in the command line, then uh, these exact options will be uh, lost in history very quickly. So in this case, I'm submitting a serial job and I'm asking for five minutes only, so uh, the format is uh, hours, uh, column, minutes, column, seconds, five minutes, and optional can supply the job name, but you don't really have to do it. And I'm asking for 100 megabytes memory per core, and it's a serial job, so there's a single core. And then uh, in my case, I have, because I have several, uh, several accounts uh, in, in Compute Canada, I have to supply the exact account, the exact allocation under which I want to submit this job. And then, so these are what I highlighted are all the flags I need to submit a serial job. And then the last line in my script is the name of the program that I'm going to run. So what I'm going to do now, I can simply say as batch job underscore serial dot sh. I'm going to hit enter and it will submit the job. So it says submitted batch job, job number. And then I can simply uh, check for the running job. So I'll say uh, sq minus u followed by my username. And it says the job is running. So status r means running. So let me check again. So it's still running. It was submitted just a few seconds ago, but it's a quick job. So it's just finished running. It took about 10 seconds or so. And if I do ls in my current directory, there is a file called slom jobidout and it actually contains all the terminal output that my job produced. So in this case, it printed simply pi and, and the error. So this is how you submit uh, serial jobs, right? You just need to specify a few options and then say as batch, optionally supply some flags, followed by the job uh, submission script, and then the job should run uh, hopefully soon. So to check for running jobs or pending jobs, jobs that are uh, in the queue but that have not started yet, 
you simply say SQ minus uh, U followed by your username. And then for a completed job, if you want to check how, my, how much resources it used, for example, one of the important things you want to know is how much memory it used. You can simply say uh, CACCT, uh, sorry, SACCT, that stands for uh, slow account minus G job ID, dash dash format, uh, followed by any number of uh, things, fields that you want to show. Uh, in this case, job ID, the maximum uh, resident uh, size, uh, so the memory footprint of your job and the elapsed time, and it will tell you uh, for a completed job, it will print out that information. So this is how you submit serial jobs. The next slide is submitting array jobs. Here the idea is the same that you submit a job uh, that was compiled, that serial job that doesn't use any parallelism, but you can submit a bunch of job as a single, um, uh, in a single step. And the idea here is that instead of submitting, let's say, 30 or 100 or how many uh, serial jobs, you simply, simply submit a bunch of them to the scheduler, and it will be much easier for the scheduler uh, to uh, find an allocation for your jobs. For example, it might use a whole node allocation or something like that. And then uh, these jobs are exactly the same. They will use exactly the same executable, but uh, they might differ in the list of parameters that they take in by an input file. So in this example, for example, I have the... Um, I have the executable that is called my program, and then I put a, uh, I pass an input uh, file uh, name to it. So there, there are 30 instances, there are 30 executables that are going to be run as part of this job, and they will respectively uh, take the input file names called input one dot dot, input two dot dot, and so on. And this is done by the Sloom environment variable called Sloom array task ID that will simply uh, take the well the, the rank of the uh, task that is currently uh, running as part of a of a single job. And all of this, all of this is uh, spelled out in more detail in our wiki pages. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them I me mean, after, well, at the end of this uh, webinar or send us an email or simply go to our documentation wiki pages. So to submit an OpenMP job, uh, you will uh, do something very similar, except that now you have to obviously compile an OpenMP job. And also you'll need to specify how many, uh, how many cores, how many uh, processes you want to uh, this job to run on. So in this case, I'm asking for uh, four cores. So it's a single task, single task OpenMP job, but there are four cores that will be used as part of this uh, well, in this run. I'm also asking for, in a slightly different format, I'm also, in this case, it's days, hours, and, and minutes. Again, I'm asking for five minutes, 100 megabytes for the whole job, not per core, but for the whole job. I specify my account under which I want to run this job. And then I need to specify this variable, OpenMP num threads, that is going to be used by the job at runtime to find out exactly how many how many threads it needs to launch, uh, uh, well during during execution. So this variable is is passed to the actual executable OpenMP. So let me run the demo. I have the code here. It's called shared pi. Again, the same same algorithm, but now it's an OpenMP job. And to compile it, I'll simply say so. For uh, for let me go back to the slide. For the Intel compiler, it's minus Q OpenMP. So I'll simply say ICC minus Q open OpenMP shared pi followed by the name of the executable that I'm going to call shared, or I guess I should call it OpenMP because that's what I have in my job submission script. It compiles the the code. Now I have the OpenMP executable, and then I'm going to submit the job using the uh, script called job openmp.sh, and this is exactly the same script I showed on my on my slide. And all I'm going to do is say as batch followed by the uh, script name, and then it will run the job. So let me check for uh, the queue. So I think the job already finished running. Uh, so let me uh, check a list. There should be two files. Yep, now there are two files. So the serial run and then the output of the serial run and the output of the latest run. Uh, let's see, yeah, that's the latest run, the OpenMP run. And this is what the, uh, uh, yeah, the OpenMP run produced. So remember, there was a line echo running on this number of cores, and that's what it says, running on four cores, and then pi and the error in computing pi. So next slide is uh, submitting submitting MPI jobs. So the idea is the same. You have to uh, compile, in this case, an MPI job. So I have the uh, script, uh, the, the code, uh, again, C code, that was parallelized using the, um, the MPI library, distributed pi.c. I simply compiled with MPI CC, distributed pi.c minus o MPI. And then I submit with uh, the script. Now the script asks for 
uh, more than one MPI process. So I'm saying dash dash tasks uh, equal to four. So I'm asking for four cores uh, for four uh, MPI tasks, and then each MPI task will run on a single core. And then I'm also asking for five minutes, and then 100 megabytes of memory per task per core. And then I can run it using uh, using the srun command. So srun command will simply take the executable in this case MPI. And it will run it. It will basically um, launch the uh, right parallel environment uh, at runtime, and uh, and it will run your job. So let me let me do this. I will simply say npi cc uh, distributed pi dot c dash o npi. That's the name of the executable. And then it was created. Here we go. And then I'll say s batch job npi dot sh. And then it was submitted. It gave me the job ID number, so let me do sq, oops, sorry, sq-u Razumov, and I, it looks like it ran already. So let me do slum and check for the output. So you see that it didn't take any time to run at all. So it ran a four core job, four task, four processor job, and then it says process uh, given rank zero to three out of four. Start it and then it uh, computed Pi in parallel using MPI library. So let me uh, show you how you can actually uh, use the S, sorry, how you can use the S S C C T command. So basically, you'll need to say that for a completed job, you'll say uh, S C T minus G. Then uh, let's take the latest MPI run. That's the job ID. And I'm curious about the memory it used. So I'm running this command. And here, what it says. So the, uh, there, there, are, there are several fields here, and actually, I'm not sure which field is the. Let's see, which field is going to be the right one. So in this case, uh, sorry, I'm not actually 100% sure. But the idea is that it will show. So in max uh, SS, it will show you the maximum resident uh, memory for uh, the task that uses the most the, the most memory. Uh, so one thing, one caveat with this is that Sloan pulls uh, memory at uh, distinct uh, points in time. Uh, so that uh, sometimes if you have a memory spike that uh, caused your job to be, uh, to be killed, uh, uh, Sloom might not have uh, pulled the job at the right time and might, might have missed that uh, spike in memory usage. And in this case, it will not report uh, the memory usage uh, correctly. So you have to be aware of this. Uh, submitting GPU jobs, uh, the idea is the same. Uh, you basically ask for how many nodes you want to use, how many, how much memory you want to use per node. And in this case, you need to supply a, a, a specific GPU requirement. So I'm saying that use one GPU per node, ask for three nodes. And then uh, your job will run on, uh, not on the CPU partition, but one of the uh, GPU nodes on the cluster. And depending on whether these uh, nodes are busy or not, so depending on how many well, GPU jobs are currently running. Your jobs will start, and maybe you'll have to wait uh, some time, and then it will be uh, run on one of the uh, GPU, uh, GPU nodes. Uh, so interactive job, a very important uh, slide. You have an option to submit an interactive job. That means that you'll get, uh, so once the job starts running, you'll get immediately a uh, job prompt, a bash, job, uh, sorry, a bash uh, job, sorry, a bash uh, shell prompt. Uh, as part of your job, and there you can run interactive commands, and these commands will be uh, part of your job. So why is this useful? Well, perhaps you want to uh, debug or test the code, and you want to run multiple instances. In that case, you do one, one uh, well, submit a single job, and then you run multiple instances as part of the job. Uh, alternatively, maybe you're doing visualization, and you want to run uh, some sort of a, a server, let's say VNC server, or a Paraview server as part of your job, and then you run the uh, corresponding client, let's say Paraview client or VNC client on your laptop, and you can kind of connect the two via SSH port forwarding, and then you can actually do interactive GUI work as part of a scheduled job on a uh, compute node. So for visualization, we actually have, uh, yesterday I added uh, some documentation uh, linked here uh, to the wiki on how to do interactive uh, Paraview client server visualization on Syrian gram on um, on, uh, on, uh, in, uh, well, as part of the interactive job on a uh, CPU node. So as Patrick mentioned, uh, GPU-based rendering is still buggy. It doesn't work yet, but we're working to bring it to you. Uh, but CPU-based rendering works. You can do it in serial. You can do it in parallel. And it's, uh, it, it works very nice, actually. Um, so uh, Slurm script flags and environment variables. Um, 
I'm already mentioned this, so I'm going to, because we're running out of time, I'm going to uh, advance the slides. Uh, so this is long jobs in memory. This is something that I mentioned briefly already. So your job, if you ask, if you don't ask for enough memory, and your job uses more than the limit you specify, your job will be killed. So you have to be careful uh, to specify the right amount of memory. And obviously, if you specify too much, then uh, your job will uh, end up waiting uh, a long time in the queue because you ask for too much resources. And then when it runs, it will not use all the memory. So some, some part of the uh, resources will be wasted. So it's a very good idea to know very well how much memory your job is using. And it's actually quite tricky because uh, if you don't know the internal structure of the code, then, and you don't know uh, what, what, what the data structures are being allocated by your code, then it's actually very tricky to find out exactly how much memory you'll need. So uh, the best option you have is to use the uh, as ACCT command that I already mentioned uh, to probe the, uh, the uh, memory usage of a recently completed job. And then uh, when you uh, schedule the next job, give yourself a little bit of a cushion, maybe 15 or 20% on top of uh, your, your estimate and then uh, the job should run safely. So, but be aware please of what I mentioned already, the discrete time uh, polling nature of uh, slope memory estimation. It might not be always accurate because it uh, runs it uh, maybe once a minute, or maybe a few times a minute, and it doesn't, uh, for, so for sudden uh, spikes in memory usage, it just will not be able to capture these. Uh, getting information about your job, I already mentioned some of these commands, and I, because we're running out of time, I will not spend much time on this. So uh, best practices in computing. So these are some things that uh, we try to stress often, and some of these things uh, Patrick mentioned already earlier today. So production runs, uh, please make sure that uh, anything CPU intensive, you don't run on the login node. It has to, these jobs have, or these uh, calculations have to submit it to the scheduler and uh, to run on as part of a submitted job. Please only request the resources, runtime, and memory that you need. Don't ask for, let's say, seven days or a day if you only run an hour-long job, simply because your job will end up waiting for a long time and then resources will be wasted. Uh, for faster turnaround, so this is something that Patrick and, and Camille mentioned already, uh, it's a good idea to ask for whole nodes just because, well, simply because of the partition setup in Slurm on the clusters and for short run times, and then your job will uh, run faster. Don't run unoptimized code. So when you compile the code, there are uh, flags, compilation flags minus 02, minus 03. And these are used automatically with the MPI scripts. But if you uh, say GCC or ICC, use the uh, compiler, um, uh, compiler commands directly, then it's a good idea to also specify, let's say, minus 02 for, for uh, job, up, for, sorry, uh, compilation optimization. It will take a little bit longer for the job, sorry, for uh, your code to compile, but the job on average will run several times faster. Uh, be smart in the choice of programming languages, so please know that things like Python and R can actually be very, very slow in native loops and native arithmetic. So it's a good idea to use uh, a compiled language if you can. Uh, file systems um, are not, so parallel file systems uh, are not optimized for storing a large number of files. So unlike on a laptop, you can create, on your laptop you can create a directory with let's say 100,000 files to LS and will pretty much list all the files in the directory. On a parallel file system, uh, there will be lag uh, because uh, these systems, parallel file systems, have been optimized for storing a small number of large files on, for a uh, high I.O. bandwidth, but not for storing a large number of small files. So if your code for some reason outputs a large number of uh, files, then either modify your code to uh, simply output fewer files or use uh, usual uh, Unix archival commands, things like da and, uh, sorry, ta and DAR, disk archival tool, which is actually not known to uh, many people, but which is incredibly useful and is uh, an open source replacement for ta, but it also comes with built-in indexing. So searching and extracting files with da is much, much easier than, than with ta. So don't, st uh, don't store large files as ASCII tags, simply because binary storage is much more efficient. Use scientific uh, data, uh, data libraries, uh, such things like NetCDF uh, and HDF5, simply because they will give you portability, compression, uh, binary storage, uh, and much better uh, I.O. efficiency. Uh, so we have a lot of documentation, and uh, as we speak, we keep adding a lot of, uh, a lot of documentation to the uh, wiki pages. So wiki pages are editable by users as well. So if you have some useful uh, tips or hints, 
uh, please don't be shy. You can add it, add these to uh, the wiki pages as well. If you have any questions, let us know. So the email, the main email address is support at computecanada.ca. There are also multiple addresses for specific comments, things like questions on Globus, for example, you can send an email to globus at computecanada.ca. But if you're not sure which exact email address uh, to use, simply send an email to support at computecanada.ca and uh, your question will go to the right queue. Uh, also, please, uh, in, in your email, please try to give as much information as possible, simply because uh, the more information we'll have from the beginning, things like error messages, which cluster you're using, uh, exact location of your job, which job script you use, and so on. So the more information we have from the beginning, the faster we'll be able to help you. And also, please get to know your local support. We have uh, Westgrid staff in most Westgrid uh, partner institutions. So these uh, staff will be happy to help you, especially if you're a novice user, if you're just getting started with Compute Canada systems uh, and you're not sure how to proceed, they will be happy to uh, meet with you in person and answer all your questions.